Okay, so welcome everyone. Um, this event is video recorded. So uh, um, as you know, if you don't want to, to take the floor uh, when during the, the webinar, uh, you can use the chat to, to post your comments or to post your questions. Uh, I will be here to collect your comments and your questions. And at the end of this webinar, uh, we will uh, address uh, your comments and your questions. But first of all, welcome to the webinar on e-justice and online dispute resolution as part of the course in civil litigation in a comparative perspective within the bachelors in comparative European and international legal studies of the University of Trento Faculty of Law in the framework of the Conflict Managers of Tomorrow project. Well, today we are honored to host two special guests, Alessandra Moretti, member of the European Parliament and Professor Luca Del Pubel from San Diego State University, who conducts research on online dispute resolution. And this is why uh, I wanted to have him as our special guest. Through their insightful contribution, we will explore a crucial contemporary topic, the digitalization of civil justice. While studying civil litigation without dealing with e-justice and online dispute resolution would mean to avoid some of the most important and current issues of our times. Digitalization is in fact something we constantly experience in our daily life. It's a phenomenon that has inevitably also affected civil justice. And this is why I decided to organize this, organize this webinar and invite Alessandra Moretti and Luca Del Pubel. Unfortunately, Alessandra has been asked to attend a meeting at the EU Parliament today, a meeting that she couldn't skip. Therefore, she sent a video recording. Uh, as Alessandra is strongly supporting the digitalization of civil justice, uh, she wants to share with us the European Union effort and her personal commitment in this field. She's also promoting internship programs at her parliamentary office. Thus, we are working on an agreement to allow our students to apply for these programs. So I will share a short video uh, with you. And I ask Beatrice to share the video. Soon again. In good morning, professors. Good morning, students. It's a pleasure to be in class with you, unfortunately, for the moment, only virtually, but hopefully soon again in presence. First of all, I would like to thank Professor Dalla Bontà for inviting me to give a short overview of the European perspective on edge justice together with Professor Luca Del Pubel, that I hold in the highest esteem. I hope this is only the beginning of a fruitful collaboration with the University of Trento. Let me introduce myself. I'm Alessandra Moretti. I'm a member of the European Parliament in SND Group, the second largest group in the European Parliament. I was elected in 2019 for the Italian Northeast constituency, which includes Veneto, Emilia Romagna, Friuli Venezia Giulia and Trentino Alto Adige. I'm currently a member of the Committee on the Environment, Public Health and Food Safety and of the Special Committee of Beating Cancer and I'm a substitute in the Committee on Transport and Tourism and in the Committee on Women's Rights and Gender Equality. Besides being on MAP and dealing with politics for many years, I'm first and foremost a lawyer by trade. This is why my engagement in justice issues is always high even from the European perspective. I deeply believe that the use of ICT in the justice sector represents a great opportunity to improve the effectiveness of justice systems and facilitate access to justice. That was the case for the European e-justice portal launched in 2010 and progressively improved by the European Commission together with member states and also for a Eurolex that has now become an indispensable tool for the legal profession. The European institution's commitment to building the European e-justice system dates back more than a decade, starting from the Justice and Home Affairs Council in July 2007. 
the European Parliament adopted its first resolution on e-justice in December 2008, following the communication of the Commission towards a European e-justice strategy. Since then, the development of the European e-justice has been exponential. So far, two European e-justice action plans, together with an e-justice strategy, have led the development of e-justice in Europe. Moreover, in 2019, the Council renewed its commitment to this subject with the adoption of the 2019-2023 Strategy and Action Plan. Today, new challenges arise, particularly in the field of data protection, and new frontiers emerge, such as the use of artificial intelligence in e-justice. The COVID-19 pandemic has highlighted the need for spending up the digitalization of justice and Italy in this urgency is particularly noticeable. There is still a long way to go and the European Union will play an essential role. In doing so, as always in legal matters, we must not forget the importance of balancing rights. I'm sure that this course will provide you with all the knowledge you need to form a critical opinion of this subject. That is why I will now leave the floor to Professor Dalla Bontà and Professor Dal Pubel to explore further the topic of e-justice and online dispute resolutions. I'm looking forward to welcoming you to my office in the European Parliament soon. Thank you for your attention. Here we are. Okay, so um, as, uh, as Alessandra has just emphasized, uh, digitalization is uh, something that we constantly experience uh, in our daily life. Uh, it is a phenomenon that has inevitably also affected civil justice. Digitalization uh, affected the, the judicial machinery before the pandemic. But digitalizing the civil litigation system became a necessity with the spread of COVID-19. With the pandemic, the need to safeguard civil justice as any other essential service became apparent. Civil justice should always be ensured even when social distance is imposed for public health reasons. Thus, as some scholars have currently said, the COVID-19 crisis has underlined the need to strengthen the resilience of the justice system and digitalization plays a key role in building a more resilient justice system. But what does digitalization of civil justice mean? And to what extent has digitalization occurred? What are the main issues underlying this phenomenon? And what are the challenges that digitalizing civil justice raises? And what is the future of civil justice in a digitalized world? Well, the topic of digitalizing civil litigation is vast and multifaceted. While in this meeting, we will only be able to scratch the surface of this topic, our purpose is to bring you closer to an ever changing and developing field in the hopes of catching your curiosity. That digitalization, digitalizing civil justice is an ever developing phenomenon is not surprising. The digitalization of civil justice is indeed something that is closely connected and primarily caused by the advent of information and communication technology. ICTs. From the 90s of the last century, information and communication technologies have affected the civil justice system as they did for any other aspects of our lives. Although courts have always been reluctant to innovate, the changes brought by the ICTs were so far reaching that even the stubbornness of the civil justice system and its courts could not ignore the influence, this influence anymore. Looking back, we can say that a so-called digitalization movement has affected civil justice at the global level. And this movement has been characterized by three waves. In the first wave, 
the penetration of digital technologies uh, into courts consisted of an increasing courts computerization. As courts were computerized, internal processes shifted from paper-based to computer-mediated. Lawyers, court administrators, and individual judges started relying less and less on paper, and they started using computers for processing court-related documents. At that time, however, computer, computerization was still an internal and bureaucratic development. Parties and lawyers' communication with courts remain paper-based or require physical presence. The idea behind this penetration of digital technology into courts was to promote efficiency in case management. The second wave was characterized on the one hand by the development of the court website as part of the e-government plan. And on the other hand, by the introduction of electronic data transmission and informatic services into civil proceedings. The development of court websites was designed to promote transparency and open access to information that were unavailable or difficult to obtain in the past. Open access to information was part of the growth of the so-called e-government movement a movement which aimed to make more governmental information and new tools available to the public. The introduction of electronic data transmission and informatic services into civil proceedings was designed to simplify and speed communication between courts and lawyers. Instead of paper-based lodge with the court, paper files and paper dockets and paper-based notification and communication, electronic lodge, electronic files, electronic dockets and notification were made possible. And for instance, in Italy, through the so-called Processo Civile Telematico. While well, the third wave of the so-called civil justice digitalization movement is the most recent, and we are still on its crest. The third wave is very complex. It presents various ramifications being in the most challenging wave as its future developments are still uncertain. The social and economic background of this third wave is conversely clear. It is represented by the decisive change that the internet experienced at the end of the last century, when the internet became a commercial as well as a research network. That change made e-commerce and big data economy a reality. It was a Copernican change with significant consequences. One of these has been the huge rise, rise of disputes. Most of them were new types of disputes that we never had in the pre-digital era. As Shurdri pointed out, the growing use of new technologies is always followed by growth in number and in nature of disputes. Disputes increase whenever transactions and relationships increase. And there is no doubt that the internet as well as the new information and communication technologies foster transactions and relationships. Inevitably, the growth of disputes has dramatically affected civil justice. Courts were not prepared for dealing with the increasing number and variety of disputes. Suddenly, the courts found themselves overwhelmed and unable to serve a rapid, cheap, and efficient justice. It is against this background that the third wave of digitalization of justice has taken place. And different approaches have been adopted to respond to litigation explosion that came with the new millennium. A first response focuses on in-court litigation and envisions new ways of conducting court litigation. More precisely, this approach promotes a shift from a physical setting to a virtual or semi-virtual one. Courts should operate on either all, all online platforms or platforms that combine physical face-to-face -face presence with online activities. 
In these new, uh, in these new court systems that we can call e-court systems, individuals can access to court, evaluate the legal stance, communicate with other party, and have the judge decided their dispute, all without having to physically attend the court or be restricted to court operating hours. Such e-court systems clearly involve promoting the development and use of secure and high quality distance communication technologies in order to allow, for instance, the video conferencing hearing or the taking of evidence via video conferencing. This shift from a physical setting to a virtual or a semi-virtual one has proven essential and necessary in the COVID-19 crisis. With the enforcement of social distancing measures, paper-based proceedings, physical presence in court, as well as traditional transmission of documents have become impractical, impracticable, ultimately creating an obstacle to the right of access to justice to the detriment of both individuals and businesses. Digital technologies have the potential to improve access to justice and the efficiency of justice systems. At the time when pandemic has shown all the shortcomings of traditional judicial proceedings, access to justice need, needs to keep pace with current societal development and appropriate digitalization of civil justice could effectively respond to emerging challenges. At the European Union level, as Alessandra pointed out earlier, further steps towards digitalization of civil justice have been taken. Just to mention a few of these steps, with the aim to modernize justice systems at both national and European Union level, on the 2nd December 2020, the European Commission adopted the communication on digitalization of, of justice in the European Union. And with a focus on cross-border judicial proceedings on the same day, the European Commission adopted the proposal for a regulation on computerized system for communication in cross-border civil and criminal proceedings, the so-called e-codex regulation. An e-codex is an acronym for e-justice communication via online data exchange. E-codex is considered a key technological enabler for modernizing communication through digitalization in the context of cross-border judicial proceedings. It consists of a package of softwares uh, of software components that enables the connectivity between different national systems thus allowing their users, competent judicial authorities, legal practitioners and citizens to electronically send and receive documents, legal forms, evidence or other information in a swift and secure manner. E-Codex um, is therefore uh, a way to establish an interoperable and secure decentralized communication networks between national IT systems supporting cross-border civil and criminal law proceedings. While one of the biggest challenging, challenges facing the European Union is to employ digital technologies more efficiently and achieve better use of digital technologies, as Alessandra mentioned earlier, whilst complying with fundamental rights and the principles of proportionality and subsidiarity. Well, the second approach adopted to respond to the litigation explosion uh, brought about by the new millennium focuses on dispute resolution mechanisms other than court litigation. It is in this context that online dispute resolution, ODR, has developed. The idea behind this approach is twofold. On the one hand, the internet, as well as the new information and communication technologies, are dispute generation engine, as Ethan Cash clearly stated. In other words, 
an online environment that continues to grow rapidly in novel and complex ways is also a powerful dispute creation engine. It creates a number and kind of disputes that we, we could never imagine in the pre-digital era. Think, for example, of the range of conflicts linked to cyberspace, such as hacking, identity theft, intellectual property cases, and disputes between domain name holders and trademark owners. On the other hand, traditional dispute resolution systems seems to be lagging behind. Except for a few uh, large and serious cases, the vast majority of the cyberspace disputes never reach the court. They are indeed too low in value in comparison to litigation costs. And traditional alternative dispute resolution devices, ADRs, have also become anachronistic for many kinds of the cyberspace disputes. In fact, cyberspace disputes are so many and frequent, and they need such a quick solution that the traditional ADRs are not efficient enough. Consequently, they are often left to individual company or group to handle, to somehow find a solution or more commonly to live with the problem or pretend that these cyberspace disputes won't have any consequence. In conclusion, neither the courts nor alternative processes are prepared to handle the volume, variety, and character of disputes produced by the creative and commercial activities happening online today. Against this background, the second approach to litigation explosion generated by the widespread use of the internet and uh, information and communication technologies tries to, uh, to employ technology both to resolve and prevent the cyberspace disputes. This approach strives to create new avenues for dispute resolution and to make more efforts at dispute prevention. We can say that this approach strives to apply the Frank Sanders motto to fit the forum to the fast to our current time. If you remember, we mentioned Frank Sanders motto during our course and we can say that nowadays, this Frank Sanders motto to fit the form to the fast is applied to our current times. Well, in this context, uh, online dispute, re uh, dispute resolution has been developed. As Luca will emphasize, ODR is rather complex issue because legal systems have different views of this mechanism. Furthermore, technologies and ways in which they are used develop so quickly that it, it, that it is hard for ODRs to keep up. However, as we will see, ODR should be considered as, uh, shouldn't be considered as traditional ADR simply transferred to the online environment. Online, is not just an arbitration, mediation, or negotiation, which takes place remotely using secure and high quality distance communication technologies. So it is hard to define what online dispute resolution is, but we can say that ODR is not just an arbitration, mediation, or negotiation, which takes place remotely using secure and high quality distance communication technology. Conversely, ODR is something more and is something different. It is an avenue of dispute resolution where technology plays an active role in helping conflicting parties to reach a mutually beneficial agreement. In fact, in ODR, technology is considered the fourth party in dispute resolution process. And Luca will explain us what this exactly means. Well, the reference to the active role played by technologies in ODR lead, leads us to the third approach adopted to deal with the litigation explosion. In ODR, the active role played by technology often means to employ artificial intelligence to help parties find a solution to their dispute. More precisely, it means to employ algorithms 
to process data and provide conflicting parties with a possible outcomes uh, to their dispute, outcomes that they can accept or not. But artificial intelligence is certainly the new frontier of digitalizing civil justice and its employment is envisioned not only within ODR, but also within court ju uh, justice. And while algorithms are the so-called fourth party in ODR, they could also uh, be employed in court litigation to process data and provide the parties and judges with a solution. In other words, algorithms are introduced into, into the judicial decision process. In this new sense, some scholars talk about e-courts. In this new sense, algorithms is, are used within the court. And when we talk in this context about e-courts, we talk about courts which employ artificial intelligence to serve justice. Well, the employment of artificial intelligence is the new frontier of digitalizing civil justice. And as uh, Alessandra has already stressed, the employment of artificial intelligence in civil justice raises many and extremely important issues. Most of them are related to compliance with fundamental human rights and procedural safeguards. Some scholars uh, say that algorithms can be seen uh, as a means to curb human discretion, to increase consistency of outcomes, uh, means to reduce biases. But at the same time, other scholars stress that algorithms may, may also operate in a biased fashion and challenge aspiration of justice. So the solution of this dilemma, which is a dilemma of our digital era, lies on the ability to monitor the manner in which such algorithms operate and to monitor the values that guide algorithms design. This is something that is up to human beings and ultimately to legal uh, systems to decide. In other words, this is clearly a policy choice. And this is one of the most challenging problems that our digital era poses. And this is one of the most crucial issues of the current cultural, social, political, economic, and legal debate. And I believe that you as future graduates should take part in this debate. You should contribute uh, to this debate. The European Union has recently adopted a regulation proposal on laying down harmonized rules on artificial intelligence. This proposal is called Artificial Intelligence Act. And it was adopted more or less a week ago on the 20, uh, 26th April, 2021. And it might be a good food for thought for you. Well, within the Italian context, a lively debate has been ignited by the challenges that the new next generation EU 2021-2022 has arisen. As you should know, next generation EU is a temporary recovery instrument to help to repair the immediate economy, economic and social damage brought about by COVID-19 pandemic. The Council recommendation on the 2020 National Reform Program of Italy explicitly encourages the Italian government to respond to the length of civil justice proceedings and to the slow level, the low level of digitalization. Well, various proposals have been made. And last March, our Ministry of Justice Justice appointing an advisory committee to make a proposal. And this proposal has not been published yet. At the same time, uh, it, uh, it has been published the 2030 Justice Agenda. It's a kind of white book. And this white book was drafted by a working group. 
made up by academics, judges, attorneys, governmental offices, practitioners. And last week, for example, uh, an interesting webinar took place to discuss this white book. And this afternoon, another webinar will take place on this uh, justice, the 2030 justice agenda. It, it is a kind of roadmap to achieve a more connected, integrated, organized, and innovative justice so that justice can become easier, sustainable, and closer to citizens. There are many pillars in this uh, 2030 justice agenda. First of all, the introduction of genuine digital procedures in place of the mere processo civile telematico. Another pillar is the construction of comprehensive public databases of case law. And another pillar is employment of artificial intelligence as a tool of predictive justice in, within courts. And I think that reading this uh, white book, reading this uh, 2030 justice agenda could also be food for thought for you, because I really think you need to contribute to this debate because this debate is ongoing and is really the main debate in our digital era. And this is why I decided to invite Luca Del Puber to give you some insights into this topic and to have some information in order to build your opinion on online dispute resolution, the employment of artificial intelligence within civil justice. And this is why I will pass the floor uh, to Luca to listen to his lecture. And thank you, Luca, to be here. Well, thank you, Professor Dalla Bontà. Um, and thank you for such a great and uh, presentation on the digitalization of justice. Let me share my screen with you and uh, can you all see my screen? I think it's loading yeah, we now. We can, Luca, we can see your screen. It's loading, okay. Okay, I think it's starting from the very last slide. Let me go back to the beginning. View and present. Okay, so dear students, uh, uh, good morning. It's, it's more than a pleasure to be here with you today and to talk to you about an important topic as brilliantly underlined by Professor Dalian Bonta concerning the evolution and innovation of justice through information and communication technology. My talk will focus on ODR systems and how they can help strengthen the resilience of the justice system. The task is now easy, bringing together a field in constant evolution, such as the ODR in a short lecture, involves the need to choose what to share that can provide you with a comprehensive overview of, of ODR, but also with food for thoughts for future investigation. In my presentation, I will explore the origins of online dispute resolution and address the different definitions of ODR. I will try to provide a unifying definition of ODR and look at the most used online dispute resolution processes. Also, I will explore the use of ODR in small claims court and finally, talk about ODR in the context of cross-border e-commerce disputes. I will conclude the presentation by showing two ODR platforms. And I'm happy in that my friend and uh, colleague, uh, Maurizio Di Rocco, uh, you probably all known from the uh, previous uh, webinar, is here with us today. He created and developed one of the platforms that I would like to show you at the end of my presentation. So we'll probably leave the floor to Maurizio at the end so he can show 
the platform that he created. It would also show the another platform that, the, that I developed and launched recently with some other colleagues. So to begin with my presentation, um, I will try to do my best and bear with me for about 30 to 40 minutes. So in the last decade, the pace of technological change has remarkably accelerated, putting pressure on every sector of our society. More people, businesses, and public and private entities have integrated the internet and other technologies in their daily lives and activities. New technologies such as in artificial intelligence and algorithms, 5G, the Internet of Things, serverless computing, blockchain technology, and biometrics have taken the place of others that only a few years ago seemed unsurpassable. The emergence of new information and communication technologies and the internet has reshaped the way people, businesses, and governments interact. Therefore, the demand for a new system of rules of interactions has added new challenges to the existing pluralism of national and international laws and legal system. The rapid development of newly emerging information and communication technologies and the internet have had an impact on many areas of public life, including the law. They've also opened new opportunities to significantly improve both the administration and access to justice. Technology has made a significant impact on many areas of dispute resolution, changing the way conflicts and disputes are resolved. Technology can support or enable existing manual processes of administering dispute resolution, or it can be used to re-engineer the dispute resolution process, delivering resolution in new ways. As the internet continues to grow, time, geographical distance, and language are no longer obstacles to trade, and consequently, cross-border disputes as have also increased. The absence of territorial limitation has highlighted that many provisions concerning private international law are out of date, and that the development of electronic commerce has made it necessary to introduce new regulations and provide alternative forms of justice. The need for new forms of justice that can help resolve cross-border disputes arising out of transactions in the global market has sparked over the years, a real interest in online dispute resolution among le the legal, academic, and international community and, and institutions, such as the US Federal Trade Commission, the World International Intellectual Property Organization, and the European Union. ODR is often associated with the resolution of disputes arising in the context of electronic commerce. Considering that the speed and complexity of the exchanges that take place online require, require the deciding authority to have specialized expertise relating to the technical means used rather than the legal knowledge. The term online dispute resolution was coined in the mid nineties during the advent of the internet and the launch of the first e-commerce platforms. It came from the idea of using alternative dispute resolution processes online as opposed to offline. The very first modern ODR system was created in 1995 in the United States by the National Center for Automated Information Research. The pilot project called Virtual Magistrate consisted of an internet-based arbitration system for the resolution of disputes. Unfortunately, the, pro the program did not last long as was considered a failure as only one case was arbitrated. Just a few years later, another pilot project program was launched by Professor Ethan Cash at the University of Massachusetts in partnership with eBay. 
The project objective was to resolve disputes between the eBay buyers and sellers with the help of mediation. The program was so successful, over 200 disputes handled in two weeks, that it evolved into a startup company named SquareTrade.com, which later became eBay's dispute resolution provider and the most successful online mediation service. As we can see, ODR was originally developed to meet the needs of private sectors, especially platforms like eBay and PayPal. International institutions, however, like the United Nations, have encouraged the use of alternative processes to in resolve international cross-border disputes. And the UNC trial has advocated the use of ADR platforms to help overcomes the limits of traditional justice. In the European Union, various legislative uh, initiatives have promoted the use of ODR, such as the Directive 2031 on e-commerce, the Directive 2008-52 on certain aspects of civil, of mediation in civil and commercial matters, and the Directive 2013-11 on alternative dispute resolution for consumer disputes. The European Commission has also created an online dispute resolution platform for consumers and traders seeking the resolution of our core disputes covered, covered by regulation uh, 524-2013. Although the platform is not an ODR process, it allows consumers to discuss a solution directly with traders or to electronically submit their complaints to an approved alternative dispute resolution body. Furthermore, there has been a progressive integration into the European Union legislation of the requirement to implement ODR services for the resolution of disputes arising out of online e-commerce transactions. In this regard, Regulation 2018-1150 on promoting fairness and transparency for business users of online intermediation services introduces rules for the regulation on, of the relations between online platforms and their business users, including the condition to provide internal systems for handling the complaints of business users. More specifically, the regulation requires online intermediation services providers to identify in their terms and conditions mediators who must be easily accessible either physically in the place of establishment or residence of the business user or remotely using communication technologies. Regardless of its popularity, ODR lacks a general accepted definition. The UNC trial working group uh, number three on uh, technical notes on dispute resolution defines ODR as a mechanism for resolving disputes through the use of electronic communications and other information and communication technology. In the United Kingdom, the online dispute resolution advisory group of the Civil Justice Council defines ODR in his 2015 report as the use of IT and the internet to help resolve disputes other than the computerization of the current uh, court system. In the United States, the Supreme Court of the state of New Mexico in his order that authorizes an ODR pilot program for New Mexico state courts defines ODR as a method of alternative dispute resolution for the judicial system and the courts. In Canada, the Civil Resolution Tribunal Act defines online dispute resolution as an out of court service that, provide, that, that is provided by way of electronic communication tools and are intended to assist parties in resolving disputes by agreement without direct assistance from a tribunal officer or person engaged or retained by the tribunal to provide facilitated settlement. 
Finally, the recent collaborative framework for online dispute resolution endorsed by the Asian Pacific Economic Cooperation, APAC, defines ODR as a mechanism for resolving disputes through the use of electronic communications and other information and communication technology. As you can see, many definitions can be found in laws and regulations of countries that although coming from different cultures and legal systems, share the same understanding of ODR. However, the definition and concept of ODR may vary depending on the context where they are used and the type of processes employed. It is Consider, for example, a form of alternative dispute resolution that uses technologies to resolve disputes in a faster and more efficient way. The emphasis on technological innovation is also placed by scholar Pablo Cortez, where he refers to ODR as a form of ADR, which take advantages of the speed and convenience of the internet and information and communication technology. Eric van der Voel defines ODR as the deployment of applications and computer, computer networks for resolving disputes with ADR methods. Generally speaking, then, ODR is often referred to a synergy between ADR and information communication technology. But as noted by uh, Esther Villalta, information and communication technology is a distinct element of ODR mechanism. In contrast to offline dispute resolution methods that do not require the use of technology. Furthermore, in 2001, Ethan Cash, the father of ODR, and Janet Rifkin referred to technology as the fourth body, claiming its critical role in dispute resolution. In fact, ODR may employ a wide range of technology, technologies in different ways from the use of video conferences to mediate between geographically distant parties to the use of emails for asynchronous dispute resolution or sophisticated software for automated negotiation. According to Martha Poblet and Graham Ross, the qual the qual the qual to qualify as ODR, a dispute resolution process has to fulfill at least two conditions provide online technical assistance to other process to different parties, such as the disputing parties or the mediator. And the subject matter must be either a grievance, complaint, or dispute. Some online dispute resolution can be linked uh, with public courts, while others can be part of an, uh, an e-commerce website. Many courts have introduced some forms of online system, such as, such as having judges conducting court hearings online in live streaming, allowing disclosure to be submitted through on electronic platforms and claims filed and fees, pays, and fees paid through online an online portal. In 2017, China established its first cyberspace court in the city of Hangzhou, the focal point of the e-commerce business in China, also known as the China's Silicon Valley. The court only hears internet-related disputes, like contract disputes involving online shopping, services, and copyright infringement, and all cases are tried online. Online dispute resolution processes may change and evolve with the evolution of technology and different types of ODR may emerge, especially in the e-commerce world. The use of technology transforms the ADR into online processes and techniques such as negotiation, mediation, and arbitration are employed by ODR to resolve also disputes arising out of online transactions. Such interaction becomes at times fully automated, automated negotiation, and other times involves human interaction, uh, just like in online mediation. It can be asynchronous and text-based, like in emails, instant messages. 
or synchronous, like in video conferences, conferencing and e, and e rooms. And it, and it can rely on integrated platforms or sophisticated processes based on cutting edge technology, like smart contracts or blockchain. For this reason, it's difficult to come up with an inclusive definition and classification of ODR. We can say that some forms of ODR are ADR procedures, born offline and transporting into the online world. Some others are specific to the online nature of the dispute and the forms and procedures used by the third party is called to resolve the dispute. However, we could say that generally the term ODR indicates procedures that take place for a significant part of line and tends to be associated with the resolution of out of court disputes arising in e-commerce transactions, especially those that involve consumers. The speed and technology, as well as the global aspect involved in e-commerce, define the characteristics of online transactions and require adequate form of justice that offer immediate relief to the needs of those operating in online marketplaces. However, online dispute resolution now is no longer seen as a transformation in medium for ADR processes, but as an umbrella the term covering both court proceedings and alternatives, public and private. In the National Center for Technology and Dispute Resolution Group, which brings together the most important experts and scholars of ODR, the debate on what should be understood as ODR has been reopened. Given the latest developments in the field and the confusion that many known experts who write in, who write in blogs have created. In this regard, it is important to distinguish between technology that helps the courts and tribunals in their jurisdictional function and resolution technology that may or may not operate in connection with courts and tribunals. Another important reflection is about the limits of ODR when technology is integrated that makes them totally autonomous. In this sense, it should be noted that in the field of dispute resolution, not every, everything technologically possible is desirable. And that therefore some principles and values always must always be preserved. Among which is that the decision must be reserved to a human and that this decision must be reasoned and reasonable, justified in terms understandable to people. As the potential, and here I have a slide here that shows you the debate, the ongoing debate at the National um, Center for Dispute Resolution and shows the classification taxonomy that um, putting in place uh, right now that identifies as systems without the support of technology as ADR, technologies assisted ODR, partially automated ODR, human manage ODR when the, the intervention of the, the human third parties is necessary. Technology directed ODR, where there's an integration of technology systems and fully automated ODR, such in the case of artificial intelligence. And here we could go on and debate over also the use of artificial intelligence and what the future may reserve in terms of um, avatars and avatars uh, judges. But this is not the, the aim of this presentation. So to continue as a potential framework, Draper uh, provides us with a unified ODR uh, definition, which uh, includes uh, any process or intervention used to handle disputes that employ information and communication technologies. The number of electronic forms of alternative uh, methods for dispute resolution changes over time, but negotiation, mediation, and arbitration are most frequently used. 
So we have here, for example, some forms of electronic ADR, what we call eADR, automated negotiation, online mediation, online arbitration, online conciliation, e investment, and online early mutual evaluation. We can go on with mod juries and many others. And also we have to consider that we also have many forms of what we call prevention ODR, preventive ODR. Um, but again, here we'll focus on the most used uh, uh, EADR, electronic ADR forms again, that are actually negotiation, online mediation, and online arbitration. Automated negotiation is the process by which groups and actors communicate with one another, aiming to reach a mutually acceptable agreement on some matter, where at least one of the actors is an autonomous software agent. It is widely used process to resolve e-commerce B2C and consumer to consumer disputes. The parties use an online dispute resolution platform, which provides them with technical assistance and helps them arrive at a solution. The negotiation is conducted electronically by using soft computing techniques that improve the efficiency of decision making and where intelligent agents negotiate on behalf of their owners. The parties are not required to learn specific tactics or have a set of skills to negotiate successfully their disputes. The negotiation is exclusively performed by the platform through autonomous agents that act without the need for human supervision and the intervention of a no neutral third party. CyberSettle is the most, automa most known automated negotiation platform designed to settle economic settlements. It helps the parties, parties settle single issue monetary disputes by providing a double blind technology that allows them to submit confidential offers and demands which are not disclosed to the opposing party unless and until a settlement is reached. Parties can submit up to three offers without revealing their bottom line and the system automatically compares the offers and demands and determine if they are in the range of a mutually acceptable settlement. If not, it prompts the parties to submit their next offer. Another form of automated, another important form of automated negotiation platform is provided by the smart settle. And here uh, we'll see how the platform in this uh, very short video, uh, how this platform and software helps the party negotiate, negotiating a single monetary issue through a software. As you can see, the parties, they make the first offer, but they cannot find a, a zone of possible agreement. Then they submit the second offer and then identify a zone of possible agreement in which the system then uh, finds uh, the, the, uh, the perfect uh, combination between the two offers. Of course, these offers are submitted uh, in a blind mode, as you can tell from this line which the parties cannot see the offers that are made by the other side. And then we move on to online mediation. In online mediation, the process is facilitated through the help of a platform that allows the parties and the mediator to exchange information and communicate virtually instead of face-to-face. -face. The communication can be synchronous. The parties interact in real time through uh, for example, video conferencing like Zoom, Google Meet, Skype, or Eastern messaging, or asynchronous uh, through, for example, emails and text messaging. Currently, many providers offer online mediation to secure encrypted chat rooms or virtual rooms. Purpose built platforms like the well known Italian resolving online of the Chamber of Commerce of Milan. American Amodia and mediation experts, 
or the newly launched spaces of the platform modem provide online mediation to both asynchronous and synchronous communication tools. And at the end of the presentation, as I said earlier, um, our friend uh, and colleague uh, Maurizio Di Rocco will show the platform that he developed and created, which shows one way of doing online mediation. Now we're gonna um, watch the short video on how explain on how resolving online uh, platform can help the parties through an online mediation. Here is not a uh, uh, there's no audio, but you can at least have an idea of how the platform works. So the parties can resolve their uh, disputes, especially related to uh, online transactions by going to the platform, fill out a form with their information, uh, with the information of the other party. A brief explanation of the problem and the dispute. And then by showing, by um, choosing if they want to resolve the, the uh, dispute through mediation or evaluation. Then they can also upload documents to provide, to support their position. And if the other side decide to mediate or to conciliate, they receive an email with a username and a password. Then they can choose again between mediation that is conducting through uh, chat. Where they can, the parties can communicate directly with the other side or directly with the mediator and the mediator helps settle the dispute and to, and to sign an agreement. Or they can choose uh, evaluation where the evaluator will examine the documents um, uploaded by the parties or presented by the parties and will help the parties find a, a solution with a proposal. So this platform shows you completely how a form of online uh, mediation can be used to help parties resolve uh, disputes related to online transactions. Um, lost my train of thoughts. <laughs> okay, online mediation provides uh, an easier and more flexible way to resolve cross-border disputes, especially in the context of low value, high volume e-commerce consumer disputes. In this context, mediation can help protect consumer rights by providing with a speedy and cost-effective redress mechanism as an alternative to the traditional cost, um, traditional costly court hearing. Online mediation brings many advantages, but also many risks. The use of free and open tools like emails, video calls, and other types of online communication in online mediation is a cause for concern. In fact, such tools may not guarantee the effective protection of confidential and private information. Confidentiality is essential in mediation to establish a relationship of trust between the parties and the mediator, and at the same time to allow the parties to speak freely and openly. Parties must be sure that their information is protected and that mediator has an ethical obligation to protect the confidentiality of the information shared by the parties in mediation. In online mediation, communication and exchange of information often take place through unsafe networks. Documents are shared through files that are stored on local servers or the cloud and data is transferred from one computer to another, increasing the possibility of being intercepted and copied. Therefore, online mediators should rely on safe and secure 
technology like encryption that can safeguard uh, all data sharing, including uh, uh, case information and evidence, or digital signatures that can help protect identity or finally on blockchain technology. And then we'll move on to the last uh, ADR, uh, electronic ADR methods that I'm going to uh, uh, explore here today, online arbitration. In online arbitration, the arbitrator is called to decide on a dispute through an online platform. The entire process take, takes place online, as well as the communication and notifications between the parties and the arbitrator and the sharing of the information and documentation. Also, the arbitration award is rendered online and is usually recognized unless national laws uh, regulating arbitration required an award to be in a specific form. Due to the nature of, of these proceedings, arbitration is probably easier to conduct online than mediation, where direct communication between the parties and the mediator is key to the success of the process. Although arbitration is not a popular method for the resolution of consumer disputes, in the United States, arbitration clauses are often found in consumer contracts. And many websites that offer goods and services to consumers include such clauses in their terms and condition of sale. By clicking I agree on the terms and conditions of the consumer is bound to resolve any dispute arising out of, the con of that contract to arbitration. Generally speaking, pre-dispute arbitration clauses in consumer contracts are enforceable in the United States, even if they provide for binding arbitration. The enforcement of agreements to arbitrate is regulated by the Federal Arbitration Act, Title IX, uh, U.S. Code of Section 2. The uh, Federal Arbitration Act considers pre-dispute agreements uh, valid, irrevocable, and enforceable. Were, whether they are included in business contracts or consumer contracts. On the contrary, European Union laws restrict the validity of pre-dispute arbitration clauses in consumer contracts. Also, online arbitration agreements and awards seems to be admissible and enforceable under the 1958 New York Convention. In many civil law countries, the laws governing arbitration have extended the formal requirements of the 1958 New York Convention to include electronic communications. Now I'm gonna go on and explore the use of ODR in small claims court, um, mentioning practical examples. So despite the advent of the internet and the development of increasingly advanced technologies, every citizen around Every year, citizens around the world face many logistical difficulties and barriers to assess uh, the justice system. However, digital technologies that can make legal processes more efficient and help alleviate the overhead of the courts, especially when it comes to small claims disputes, which often constitute the highest number of civil cases. For instance, in the United States, more than three quarters of civil cases in state and local courts involve claims of $5,000 or less. Online dispute resolution can provide people with the necessary tools to assess the justice system and help them settle their disputes. ODR can be seen as both a competing and complementary tool to traditional in-court schemes and state-run judicial systems. ODR can allow greater engagement in the legal process, deliver a more efficient and faster process, and improve the fairness of the civil legal system by reducing waiting times, procedural errors, and administrative, administrative inefficiencies. Many courts around the world Oops. Many courts around the world have incorporated ODR systems and introduced various forms of remote court like video conferencing, audio eatings, and paper eatings. 
In the last year, we have seen an exponential increase in the use of technology by many courts worldwide in response to the pandemic crisis caused by COVID-19, which has forced courts, courts and judicial uh, justice systems to close or limit their services. One of the first examples in the world of ODR integrating into the court system is represented by the Civil Resolution Tribunal that was launched in British Columbia in, in 2016. The CRT in Canada's, is Canada's first online tribunal that provides end-to-end -end dispute resolution services for strata property dispute of any amount. Small claims up to $5,000, motor vehicle personal injury disputes under $50,000, and disputes involving incorporated societies and co cooperative associations. In the first seven months of this implementation, the Canadian ODR system handled roughly 14,000 small claims cases. The CRT provides the user with access to free legal information, self-help tools, and dispute resolution services, such as negotiation, mediation, and when necessary, arbitration, adjudication. Another important example of the use of ODR to promote greater access to justice and efficiencies is represented by the Money Claim Online Program of Her Majesty's Courts and Tribunal Service in England. The Money Claim Online Program is an inter internet-based portal for making or responding to a money claim online for a fixed amount of money. Money claims issued through the uh, Money Claim Online Program must be uh, for an amount less than 100,000 pounds and cannot be issued for more than one claimant and against more than two defendants. Oops. Hundreds of courts from large and small jurisdictions in all over the United States have implemented ODR systems. According to uh, county rule, ODR initiatives are underway in more than 50 county and statewide court systems in the United States. So this is the situation and then we can see how the use of ODR and related online system are implemented in many courts around the world, especially in the common law countries. And now we'll uh, finally look at the uh, use of ODR in the context of e-commerce. The development of e-commerce has allowed consumers from all around the world to have access to a variety of products and services that can be purchased from the comfort of their homes or, or offices. Such development has improved competition and made products and services more affordable to consumers. High-speed internet, 5G, and the use of smartphones, smartphones have increased the reach of e-commerce, allowing a greater number of people to purchase online. Today, when shopping online, consumers can rely on a series of information regarding their purchase, such as tracking when the product will be shipped or and delivered, which gives them a more confidence in the successful outcome of their transactions. However, as e-commerce continues to grow, consumers face various issues and new challenges when shopping online, especially in concerning the protection of their rights. Generally speaking, online shoppers experience problems with the delivery of goods and services damaged products, website technical issues, online fraud, and finding information on product and services warranties, and seeking redress. Payment security, privacy concerns, delivery issues, concerns about receiving or returning goods, as well as concerns about complaints and redress mechanism are some of the most relevant reasons that prevent consumers from shopping online. The rapid growth of e-commerce has increased the frequency of disputes arising out of e-commerce transactions between businesses and consumers. Furthermore, the difficulty of filing a complaint 
or the lack of dispute resolution mechanism often discourages consumers from seeking remedies. Customer services are often difficult to reach with consumers spending time on the phone on hold and customer service representatives that many that may at times not have the authority to provide remedies. Some companies may restrict the remedies available to consumers by adding arbitration clauses to purchase contracts. Furthermore, in the case of low value purchases, which, is, which in the uh, uh, business to consumer online market represent the majority of transactions, when consumers experience problems with the purchase of goods and services, they are understandably reluctant to consider formal judicial proceedings as the forum for finding redress, especially when the loss is relatively small as litigation is costly, slow, and stressful. Considering the most recent data that suggests that the average value of a global online shopping orders as of the second quarter 2018, by device uh, ranges between $80 and $128, it seems obvious that more traditional forms of dispute resolution, including ADR such as arbitration, do not represent optimal solutions for low value claims in the context of e-commerce. B2C e-commerce need, uh, needs a dispute resolution option that, that take into account the special qualities of online cross-border transactions and provide alternatives and solution to consumers when problems or dispute occur. Online dispute resolution provides solution, especially for low value cross-border disputes. As noted by Abner and Zelisnokov, the unsatisfied purchaser, purchaser of an item online on eBay is more likely to prefer an online process for achieving redress rather than pursuing litigation with the seller who may be based in another country. In the last decade, much innovation in online dispute resolution has come from the private sector due to the high cost of maintenance and the difficulties of applying common national and international laws and jurisdiction. Already large scale online transaction providers such as eBay, Amazon and Alibaba provide their own low cost dispute resolution system with the primary goal of not resolving a large number of dispute, but instead maximizing the number of successful transactions. However, ODR platforms aim at resolving business goods consumer dispute and offering the consumers convenient, efficient, and quick means to exercise their rights have also developed in the public sector. In the last few years, more centralized, and sorry about that, this is a, an example uh, is taken from the eBay Resolution Dispute Center and shows you how you can um, file a complaint or a claim uh, in case you haven't received your item. Oops, you haven't received your item. I received the item, but it does not, ma does not match with the seller description. Or in case you are a seller and you sold an item and you haven't received the payment, or the buyer um, and you are going to cancel the, the order. If you click continue, the platform will bring you to uh, a form and you are required to file with your information and where you can upload evidence and documents. Uh, the uh, uh, dispute resolution centers and the system provided by eBay is uh, uh, done in a uh, in, uh, in layer form in which you try negotiation with uh, the buyer or the seller first. And then if you are now able to resolve uh, the, uh, the dispute, then uh, uh, eBay intervenes as a, as a form of a, a conciliator or mediator in case even that mediation is not helpful in finding a resolution, then uh, there's an adjudication that is done directly by eBay. It's just to show you how eBay implemented 
this uh, um, dispute resolution a way to resolve their uh, uh, the disputes related to biz to uh, buyers and sellers. But as I said, um, um, in the last few years, more centralized public ODR portals have begun to flourish with considerable success. For example, in Brazil, Canada, and Mexico, they offer consumers, especially those of low social economic level, an important tool for assessing alternative form of justice, protecting their rights, and resolving B2C uh, uh, disputes. The government hosted ODR platforms like Consumidor in Brazil or Concilionet in Mexico that have been designed to resolve B2C dispute between merchants and their uh, customers. Also, the European Union, as I uh, earlier mentioned, has developed a European ODR platform, which actually we now consider as an, an ODR uh, form. And here, for example, I have, um, I show you how and uh, the, 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 the and summarize how the platform in consumidors work where there's a, a registration required by consumers, a registration required by the suppliers. The registration is usually the same. You uh, provide your information, you provide information on the other side, you provide information related to this dispute, you, you upload the documents and evidence. This type of ODR is the technology enabled negotiation because it's allowed for the two parties to directly negotiate uh, to resolve the dispute through the use of the platforms. They have a response deadline, meaning that uh, the consumers that filing the claim, uh, the supplier have uh, 10 days to respond and accept the uh, negotiation. Um, there's no fees involved. It, the types of transactions they actually deal with are online or offline. There's no intermediary, so there's no third neutral parties, no mediator, conciliator, conciliator. And the nature of the decision and non binding, uh, we remember, is negotiation here. In the platform Concilionet, is the same process, registration required for both. The, this one is a facilitated settlement done by a conciliator conciliator. So it's not just a negotiation between the two parties, but here a conciliator intervenes to help resolve the disputes. And also because again, is a conciliation has no binding, uh, and, um, is a non-binding procedure. And finally, the ODR platform, um, the European ODR platform, is a facilitated settlement, even though the uh, negotiation does not take place on the platform, but either the parties resolve among themselves the issue through an exchange of emails, or they use uh, an external ADR entity uh, that can provide uh, the, the services either through mediation or uh, arbitration. That's why the nature of the decision in this case is no binding if it's a mediation or is binding if it's an arbitration. And, uh, oops, and to conclude, because I know I'm, I'm going over my time here, but to conclude, I want to say that pursuing claims before the courts or out of courts is part of the right to access to justice, protected at an international, European, and national level. ODR information and communication technology can help embrace access and enhance access to justice and provide citizens with accessible, convenient, and fast procedures. Empirical research, however, on ODR indicates that, that ODR are most efficient for disputes with a low level of complexity, such as small claims of dispute or low value e-commerce disputes. The rarity of out-of-core methods that have been transferred to the internet might be justified by a lack of trust in the modern forms of dispute resolution. To be trusted, all the R system need to rely on effective enforceable mechanism 
certification of ODR providers and a uniform regulatory frameworks that can address the complexity and the challenges of diverse legal system. As many countries, legislation do not allow the implementation of electronic out of court proceedings. So to conclude here, and I hope I uh, didn't go too long and it wasn't too boring, but the complexity of the field of ODR is, um, is done by, is made by a, a diverse uh, legal uh, system, diverse approaches and cultures, but also is made by uh, technology that are constantly innovating and, and uh, in a very fast way and in which the legislator and, and the humans all, uh, are all often behind. They cannot, uh, they cannot uh, walk at the same pace. So I hope I gave you at least a, a general overview how we can use OVR to resolve uh, uh, disputes and also to provide citizens with an alternative, uh, convenient, fast uh, and uh, approach to uh, resolve their uh, uh, disputes. And um, I, I now want to show these two platforms and I would like to, uh, um, to call Maurizio Di Rocco, attorney Maurizio Di Rocco to show uh, the uh, platform that he created and developed. Yeah, yeah, I mean, thank you, Luca, thank you very much. And uh, sorry, at first I want to sorry for my English because it's not so good. And uh, uh, I hope that Luca ca can uh, help me if uh, I have some problem. So uh, I want to show you the, the platform that is called uh, Yesi with uh, three S. I go to show you the platform. Here we are. You can see. It. Okay. Yeah, yeah. You, you, we, we can see your platform. Okay, yeah, perfect. we can. Um, this is a platform that uh, uh, is. Um, implemented, uh, was implemented by, um, from an European project. Mm -hmm. And uh, uh, it was an European project for a consumer. And uh, the platform has uh, three um, parts. Um, so it's the program consumer um, 2014 and 2020. And uh, the three parts are one, one on uh, the mediation, one mm -hmm. over the negotiation and another one over the complaint. Uh, the part uh, focused about mediation, uh, give the possibility to the, the um, lawyers uh, on uh, the privates uh, or uh, companies to uh, accede uh, to enter in a platform. So you can, uh, is, uh, this is uh, the, for example, I can show you if I remember, Remember my password. Uh, this is my fiscal code. And uh, okay. So this is a, the, the inside the platform. I um, I am uh, I entered uh, as a lawyer. And uh, I can uh, um, put inside uh, uh, um, uh, uh, I can start uh, with uh, a mediation um, and I can uh, select uh, the ADR the center, the provider of uh, uh, the mediation procedure. In this case, for example, Resolution. And uh, uh, I can uh, um, put inside uh, this platform all the date of my com complaint, my question for mediation uh, is uh, I am, uh, I can select uh, if I am uh, a physical person and a name uh, and uh, all the data that uh, are necessary for start uh, with a mediation procedure. Uh, all the data that uh, I put inside this dashboard are automatically rated by the ADR center and ADR provider. And so it's uh, very easy for, uh, uh, I can follow all, uh, 
um, all the, um, the future sequence of, oh, I want to, to show, okay. You show now the platform again. Yeah, we, we, we can see the, the, the home page where homepage. you have perfect. the mediation, negotiation, okay, and perfect, complaint. Perfect. And um, the second part, uh, uh, I'm, I'm very quickly because the time is not so, so long. The second part is the complaints part. And uh, in this section, uh, it's possible for a private people, a private person to uh, make a company, to send a complaint to a uh, company. Uh, I can show, uh, select the company, to, the company if uh, is uh, inside the list, or uh, if I don't, uh, there is not uh, my, the, the, my counterpart, uh, the company that is my counterpart is not in this list, I can, uh, um, uh, I can give uh, the address and uh, the platform uh, consent uh, to uh, individua individuate uh, the company and uh, to send uh, the claims uh, um, using uh, a certificate uh, email, even if uh, I don't have uh, my certificate email, the platform uh, consent to use the certificate email of the platform. So um, is uh, this uh, section, uh, this is possible because uh, there's uh, this part of the program is directly uh, connected with the, um, the public database of uh, companies uh, in all the nation. So this is, uh, some uh, company are just uh, indicated in the list, but uh, I can, uh, uh, select uh, my company using uh, the uh, uh, il registro imprese and uh, so I can select uh, the, the right uh, um, address of my the company that interests me. And uh, the third sec the, the last section of the platform is the negotiation. And uh, uh, in this section I can use found and use, uh the blind bidding uh, okay better and uh, this is a blind bidding uh, luca just uh, uh, speak about uh, uh, the the blind bidding the autom is a total automatic negotiation negotiation system and uh, i can uh, uh, insert my off blind offer and send it to the other parts and through an, uh, a not synchronous system uh, um, we can resolve the dispute uh, using the software. When our offer are uh, um, going in the, in a, inside a pre prefixed range, the software gives uh, the solution. Uh, you can uh, found uh, in music is clever. <laughs> there is a video that explain how the system uh, uh, is working. Perhaps uh, you can have the music, the same. So, and uh, I, if I found that there is uh, uh, um, all information you need uh, are inside. So this is the, the, the scheme, the, the, the synthesis uh, of uh, the, the, the system works. It's like a smart citadel that uh, the other uh, platform that uh, you saw uh, during the Luca um, mm -hmm. lecture. So this uh, well, is an example. Well, that's good. That's good. I think our students, uh, we, we, uh, they, they, they got uh, uh, just an impression uh, of how uh, these ODR platforms uh, work. And I, I'm looking forward to, uh, to seeing if there are some, some questions. Uh, I, I would like to start with one question from my side, because first of all, I, I, I would like to thank Luca for, for uh, his full description of, of the ODR phenomenon and ODR systems and Maurizio uh, for, for this description of one example. Uh, of ODR platforms. Um, but um, here we have a student, bachelor's students. 
And so uh, um, after this description, I have a question. Uh, do you think, uh, Luca, there is a need for new professionals, given these new horizons of civil justice or uh, dispute resolutions? Because I think our students could, could see this new uh, frontier uh, as a way to, uh, to find or to consider uh, other uh, new professions. Uh, and because here we have a combination of different expertise, uh, we, it's not only about uh, legal expertise, but it's technological expertise, digital expertise, market. And so uh, do you see any possibility to, to shape a new kind of career uh, thanks to this ODR, uh, ODR future? Yes, uh, most definitely. Uh, as you, uh, as you um, said, um, Professor Dalla Bonta, uh, um, this is a new a new frontier and uh, with a different expertise and not just the legal not just the uh, the technological expertise but also we need people with marketing expertise to market these new forms of ODR and also we need people in the administration both in the private and public sector that can administrate the uh, the, the amount the the cases that are actually submitted through the platforms. And also, uh, I would emphasize also the role of entrepreneurs. So people who would like to uh, enter this uh, field and uh, look into the different uh, opportunities that are actually out there to launch LDR platforms and other um, legal tech uh, platforms that can help uh, not just the citizens, but also the people um, that uh, are uh, that um, administer the justice or even the lawyers and be advisors to uh, uh, to uh, the legal uh, uh, professionals. So there's a variety of different uh, opportunities and possibilities to uh, find uh, new ways in which uh, you can enter a market that combines a different expertise. So I would definitely encourage students, especially if they go into the international level, to also be looking at roles inside the administrations and the governments to consult and be advisors in this new, uh, in the, in this new field. Um, yeah, but, because the idea behind this this this, uh, this lecture and this webinar was not only to to give uh, students uh, to provide uh, students with uh, with a full description of what e justice and ODR uh, are, but also uh, the idea was to to show that they can they can think of uh, uh, new ways uh, of of considering their their future careers, especially because they are of course looking forward to uh, to selecting uh, uh, the a master after after these bachelors so i i think uh, you students uh, should consider this opportunity to to combine your legal expertise with uh, technolo uh, technology expertise administration expertise because these e courts e-court systems and this ODR, I think uh, are, will open you the doors to, 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 new, to new challenges, but also to new opportunities. Uh, because in, in the other webinars, I saw that the students were very interested in, in uh, exploring uh, this uh, these, uh, opportunity that the future can give them through mediation, arbitration, negotiation, and now you can add uh, new, new horizons to, 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 to your future through ODR as well. So I, 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 was, uh, um, I was interested in, in your opinion as, as professor in, in the US. And, and if I may add, uh, there's, uh, there is a need in, in, in fact of uh, uh, people uh, and, uh, and, and younger uh, professionals who have some sort of familiarity with uh, the digital technologies because 
and you guys uh, and your students are digital natives. So, so they are born with the use of the internet and other digital technologies. But there's uh, our generation that were not born and they are definitely have an handicap when uh, dealing with new technologies. So it will be easier for you guys to find a position or a job either as a legal consultant or uh, someone that can consult and advise on the use of technologies in the realm of uh, dispute resolution and uh, justice. Many courts around the world are looking for people that can actually help with the administration and with the management of dispute uh, and, and disputes. And also many uh, lawyers are not familiar and not educated in these new forms uh, of uh, ODR or uh, e-justice. And therefore there's also a need for trainers, uh, people that can train uh, both uh, using uh, the, uh, the tools and the communication tools and the technology tools uh, and the platforms uh, to help uh, legal professionals uh, to deal with the new technologies. So yeah. there's a, and, and, uh, and to say, uh, for example, the, uh, the godfather, because uh, the father of ODR is Ethan Cash, who's actually a jurist, but the godfather of, of ODR, which I'm calling the rule, is not a lawyer. So well, let's keep in mind that, and that started already 20 years ago. Yes. Yeah. So this was one, one, uh, one, one issue uh, concerning, concerning the future. I, I see that now we have, we have a question. We, we have a question uh, uh, in our chat that it's more, uh, it, uh, it concerns uh, uh, the, the topics, so the, the many issues that we address during, during this, this lecture. And uh, 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 I, think, uh, I, I think, Luca, you can read, uh, you can read the, 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 the question. Mm -hmm. uh, and so maybe, uh, maybe we can answer uh, this, is, uh, this very interesting uh, comment. So we can respond to this very interesting uh, comment. Thank, uh, thank you, Jacobo, for all your question. And you asking, if we will arrive to a point where legal systems to cope with courts a caseload impose on prospective litigants an, an obligation to at least discuss their cases to ODR before eventually going to court, as has been done to some extent with traditional ADR. Well, to answer your first question, uh, uh, yes, even though this is a very debatable and controversial uh, topic that will definitely require another session, but there are examples around the world where uh, courts uh, to face uh, the issue of a huge uh, caseload, uh, they are requiring uh, and mandating parties uh, to use, uh, to use uh, ODR before uh, trying uh, uh, their cases in court. So this is not uh, something that is uh, definitely in, uh, new, but it's something that is already happening. And the second question, if this is the case, how is this solution going to deal with issues like asymmetry of information, mostly between business and consumers and access to technology for individuals who are not so sophisticated with such softwares or in the worst case scenario from undeveloped uh, countries? This is another good question. And uh, what I, I can say is this can be an issue when using ODR, when you have this asymmetry of information between businesses and consumers. But I can also say that uh, traditional forms of justice uh, often favor businesses where they have more resources uh, to uh, uh, deal with uh, disputes uh, rather than consumers. Online uh, dispute resolution, and especially in the softwares, and the platforms that are put in place nowadays, they keep in mind of this asymmetry between uh, businesses and consumers and tend to uh, make those platforms very, easable, uh, very easily accessible and friendly uh, user, keeping in mind exactly where people don't have the technological skills and the legal knowledge to deal with a dispute. So they're, they're making this platform simple and friendly and to use. 
And the second question is related to the un underdeveloped countries. Yes, it's true. However, I've seen uh, many different examples in underdeveloped countries in which a lot of people do not have access to a personal computer, but they do have a, a, a smartphone. And so many of this uh, um, ODR uh, tools are offered to uh, uh, digital applications throughout your phone. And also they've made in a way, very simple way. So people, even in the underdeveloped uh, countries, they are used to purchase and do activities on their phone, and, uh, although they not, don't know how to use the computer. And so that's why many of this um, many of the softwares and platform are moving to a uh, digital mobile what we're seeing in the digitalization of uh, mobile and of ODR in uh, mobile devices. Mm -hmm. I hope this answer your question or partially answer your question. Yeah, I, I, I would like to add uh, something more. So, um, uh, as regards uh, uh, information asymmetry, well, uh, that that is again uh, the, the issue of algorithms. So, if you use algorithms uh, in order to uh, to build this ODR system, you need to 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 create an algorithm that can take into account uh, information asymmetry. So we go uh, back to, to the main issue, uh, human beings and legal systems are asked to build these algorithms. And so uh, it's up to us to, to conceive and to, to build and to shape these algorithms in, a, in such a way to, uh, to protect human rights and to protect consumers. If, if we think that consumer protection is a value, as you see, it's always a political choice because uh, a legal system can, can also think, well, I don't care about consumer protection. And so I, 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 I want to use the algorithms uh, which will protect the consumers. And this is why, as, as Luca said, it's very important to uh, to find some agreements uh, uh, between uh, among the legal systems. We are in a globalized market, and so these platforms uh, should try to uh, to employ algorithms that can be accepted by the majority, <laughs> if not all, uh, legal legal systems. And about about the second the second question, if you remember, uh, Jacopo, during our our course, we mentioned a judgment rendered by uh, the Court of Justice of the European Union. Uh, if you remember, that case was Alassini, and that case was exactly on that on that issue. Uh, the issue was. Uh, how to manage cases where one of the parties to, to, to litigation uh, has not access to, to technologies, has not access to the internet. And in that case, the European Court of Justice, but was the European Court of Justice, so it was an expression of the European Union uh, view, said, well, if uh, uh, ADR, in that case was ADR is mandatory, it's not possible to use only online uh, EADR, only online tools, because in that case uh, will be uh, will compromise will compromise uh, that party to litigation who doesn't have access uh, to uh, to the internet. So uh, again, you see, it's a political is a policy choice because in that case the European. Court of Justice was really protective uh, to to consumers. Uh, it depends. It depends on on how legal systems deal with all these problems. But good questions. Both both are good and, questions. And uh, if I I can uh, add on to that, I also like to say that. Uh, yeah, so there are, I mean, there are many, many, many uh, different uh, issues and concerns uh, regarding the use of technologies. However, one uh, applause is that if we imagine us, us, access to justice and the, in, in, in the difficulties of many people of accessing justice and the justice system, yeah. especially in underdeveloped countries, 
um, where the facility, the physical facility is located far away from uh, villages and people do not have the system of transportation to reach those, uh, uh, those uh, facility, at least uh, if they uh, have a, a digital device as is just a simple smartphone, they can uh, definitely have a way in which they can access the core system. And uh, so this is a matter of policies as the Professor Dallabontal was saying. And uh, also uh, the experience around the world is going into considering uh, uh, the consumers at, as a resource because uh, businesses and uh, traders and suppliers, they make money through uh, consumers. And so in order to, uh, to protect themselves, they have to protect consumers or at least to give consumers a way in which they can uh, resolve their issues or find remedies. Otherwise, uh, the consumers, they will not be inclined to shop or use that trader or that supplier if they know there's no way to resolve the issues if the issues arises. Yeah. So uh, uh, consumer trust in market is, is an asset for businesses. And this is why, well, they, they should, or at least it's economically uh, important to, uh, to, make, to make a consumer satisfied uh, with, uh, we, with uh, the business and with uh, the purchases that they, 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 they made. So yeah, the two, the two sides are interconnected, they are two sides of the same coin. And so maybe uh, perhaps a, a, a good solution can be, can be fine. So I, I, I think we, we, we have uh, used our time, we are managing to use our time uh, profitably. And I see that, uh, for example, through these questions, you, uh, you are very interested in, in this topic. I, uh, I know that Luca uh, will be available and uh, will be ready to answer your questions, uh, also about the possible future uh, developments in this in this field uh, through email. I will uh, give you uh, his email address if you are interested. Yes, I'll also in share the email in the chat. If very you good, very good. And uh, as I said, I will upload uh, the recording, video recording of this lesson to the online platform, and I will add uh, some articles uh, to to read on ODR, so you can explore uh, this topic in more detail. So thank you, uh, Luca, again. Thank you, Maurizio, for showing uh, the platform, and thank you uh, for uh, for being here and for taking part uh, in this in this webinar. And see you uh, see you later. And thank you. Thank you. Thank you for the opportunity, and thank you for bearing with me for almost an hour. Thank you. Thank you very much. Because it was not planned in my inter intervention. So that was very nice. It was, was Luca very... that <laughs> insists. Very Thank good. You. Very good. Thank you. Bye. And bye-bye. Bye. bye. bye.